Multi actor partnerships on how to build, develop, and manage them in different contexts, both humanitarian and development contexts. And I will be moderating this session with my colleague Alejandra Rojo, who, as you have heard earlier today, is the coordinator of Alianza Shire. What we want to do in this session is look a little bit more deeply at the key issues that are relevant to the building and managing of partnerships. And we want to do that from the perspectives of different organizations working in development, in humanitarian contexts, and also in the specific areas of energy and refugee communities. Let me present the panel to you, because we're very fortunate to have a really wonderful panel to discuss these issues with us. Starting at the end of the table, we have Daphne Carlier from the Safe Access to Fuel and Energy Safe Program with the World Food Program. We then have Kelly Genet, who works with European member states on partnerships with the Norwegian Refugee Council. Then we have Claudio Mesa, who works with the Economic Cooperation and Trade Division of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. He will be followed by Fulgencio Garrido Ruiz from the Di Deputy Directorate General for International Cooperation and Development with the European Commission. We then have Maria Jesus Vega from the UN High Commission for Refugees here in Spain. How are we going to run the session? We're going to ask each speaker to briefly share their views on the building of partnerships by addressing four simple questions. The key factors you need to take into account when building partnerships, how their organization promotes partnership, how can we try and make the outcomes of the work in partnership sustainable, and last but not least, to illustrate perhaps with an example of how they are working in partnership. We will move from looking at partnerships generally in the development um, area, then move into humanitarian context, and finally into looking specifically at partnerships relating to energy and refugees. We will then invite comment from a front row who will be introduced to you shortly and have an exchange between them and our panel um, before having a quick summary of what has been said. So without further ado, I would like to ask Claudio Mezza from the uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe to begin his intervention. Claudio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh... Buenos días a todos. Yo voy a romper un poco la, la línea. Dijeron que iba a ser eh, en inglés, pero normalmente al revés. Yo tengo que hablar en inglés siempre a auditorios eh, que lo pueden seguir así. Aquí voy a aprovechar que estoy en España para hablar español. Eh, bueno, eh, como fue eh, presentado en la introducción, yo soy funcionario de Naciones Unidas de la Comisión Económica para Europa, eh, que es una de las cinco... Eh, eh, oficinas regionales de, de Naciones Unidas. En el caso de Europa, nosotros somos, eh, eh, englobamos 56 estados miembros que corresponden a todo lo que es entendido como Europa, más todas las ex repúblicas soviéticas, eh, como Kazajstán, eh, Takistán, eh, etcétera, incluyendo Estados Unidos y eh, Canadá. Y, Quisiera referirme a tres tópicos principales que fueron tocados ya en la sesión preliminar y que nosotros abordamos desde la perspectiva de la Comisión Económica para Europa de Naciones Unidas, desde la perspectiva de las alianzas público-privadas. Entonces, lo primero que voy a, a, a presentar es una definición como nosotros entendemos la, la, la alianza o cooperación o asociación público-privada. Lo primero sería decir que la entendemos como aquellos métodos inno, innovativos que buscan la alianza y la cooperación entre el sector público y el sector privado en un contrato de largo plazo normalmente, donde el sector privado trae su expertise, recursos financieros y capital, y, la, y su habilidad para desarrollar proyectos de, basados en su capacidad técnica y eh, 
donde además de aportar la capacidad técnica, aporta condiciones y capacidades que a veces son eh, más críticos de encontrar en el sector público. El sector público retiene sus responsabilidades para proveer los servicios públicos y la infraestructura y además eh, persigue tener un desarrollo sostenible y que mejore la calidad de vida de los ciudadanos. Así entendemos nosotros la cooperación público-privada. Esa es la primera definición. Esto en el contexto de la Agenda 2030 de Naciones Unidas, que fue adoptada eh, por los Estados miembros, que dice que la calidad de vida de los ciudadanos puede ser mejorada, entre otras cosas, mediante el desarrollo de infraestructura, que eh, traiga mejor calidad de vida a sus ciudadanos, que pueda permitir eh, el desarrollo total de ellos y contar con servicios básicos en el ámbito de la energía, uh, del agua, de infraestructura de saneamiento, eh, ciudades, etc. Y el tercer tópico que quiero tocar, que también se ha mencionado muy tangencialmente, es el del financiamiento. Una de las uh, eh, constataciones que se ha podido eh, observar basado en lo que es la Agenda 2030 de Naciones Unidas, es el hecho de cómo financiamos todos estos proyectos de infraestructura. Está eh, más que confirmado de que los recursos públicos no alcanzan para llevar a cabo el, la implementación de toda esta infraestructura que es claramente necesaria. Se habla de que el sector público necesita del orden de los 12 trillones de dólares americanos para poder solamente desarrollar la infraestructura que es requerida hoy en día para satisfacer las 17 metas de, eh, de SDGs, uh, de, de desarrollo sustentable, que han sido definidas por los Estados miembros. Hoy en día, los países de medios y de bajo ingreso necesitan del orden de 1,5 trillones de dólares al año para poder desarrollar esta infraestructura. Eso claramente, esos recursos claramente no existen en el sector público para proveerlo y es allí donde nosotros eh, creemos que la participación del sector privado para apoyar el desarrollo de estos proyectos se hace absolutamente necesaria. No solamente desde la perspectiva del financiamiento, pero como dije también, desde la perspectiva de sus capacidades del saber hacer y la, las características esenciales de poder lograr desarrollar estos proyectos de manera mayor, más eficiente, más a tiempo, que traen, y que traen una mayor efectividad en la instalación y provisión de estos servicios sociales. Eh, para poder hacer esta cooperación público-privada, en el caso particular nuestro, estamos tratando de desarrollar normas o estándares. Eh, a veces yo prefiero decir eh, directrices eh, o normas más que estándar, porque a veces las personas entienden que el estándar es una eh, regulación legal que implica una... Eh, participación que compromete a los estados a cumplir una línea de, de, de características que si no las cumple puede haber algún tipo de penalización legal, financiera, etcétera. Entonces, estas directrices que estamos desarrollando en el ámbito del desarrollo de infraestructura para agua y saneamiento, energías renovables, eh, y servicios públicos eh, de, en el transporte de trenes, eh, aeropuertos, carreteras, etcétera, mediante la inversión privada directa y, y o concesiones además, eh, creemos que estas normas que hoy día no existen están básicamente basadas también en lo que es, ustedes pueden haber oído, eh, eh, la, la, las 4 A de Addis Abeba Action Agenda, que dice que para poder encontrar estos recursos para satisfacer las, uh, las de 17 metas de desarrollo sustentable, tiene que haber financiamiento. Eh, en, en, esa, en esa definición de la cuádruple A se dice que los organismos internacionales, eh, del Fondo Monetario Internacional, los, los bancos de desarrollo, deben tratar de cooperar y aportar estos recursos financieros. 
pero también dice que se necesitan muchas directrices y descripciones de cómo poder hacer esta, esta eh, aportación de recursos del sector financiero a esta infraestructura que es necesaria y allí nosotros como Naciones Unidas hemos tratado de desarrollar estas normas para apoyar el, 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 el desarrollo y la integración de las alianzas público-privadas. Eh, creo haber tocado básicamente lo más importante de esos tres puntos y decir que en nuestras directrices estamos tratando de, primero, que toda esta directriz esté orientada, a toda esta alianza público-privada, nosotros lo llamamos People First, PPPs, o la gente primero en, en el desarrollo de la alianza público-privada. Eh, Anteriormente PPP se entendía como la, eh, la definición value for money. Nosotros queremos decir ahora que en vez de, de valor de, del, del valor de, de la capacidad financiera, sea el valor de las personas que esté primero en el desarrollo de estos proyectos. Eh, seguidamente se observa una necesidad de la creación de capacidad en los países porque hay una gran diferencia entre la capacidad del sector el privado y el sector público para el desarrollo de estos proyectos. Debe existir un marco político, nosotros creemos que tiene que haber un marco político que defina cómo van a actuar estos actores y, y, y de qué forma. Tiene que haber también un marco, eh, o sea, este marco político, disculpen, tiene que tener eh, eh, una hoja de ruta donde de, defina li, eh, líneas de plazo, tiempos eh, eh, en el desarrollo de estos proyectos. También debe existir claramente políticas dentro del plan nacional. Debe existir una unidad nacional que maneje esta cooperación pública-privada, que tenga el conocimiento para poder arreglar, normar y eh, ayudar a dirigir esto, que contenga un, una serie, un núcleo de valores y principios, y que esté en constante consulta con gobiernos eh, privados, eh, eh, la, eh, la, eh, la sociedad civil y también eh, de, de la integración interministerial. Eh, e, también eh, algo muy importante, identificar una línea de proyectos, los proyectos adecuados a desarrollar, ¿ya? tener una priorización en ello. Eh, finalmente, eh, decir que la integración de todo esto, nosotros esperamos tenerla radicada en estas normas que estamos de desarrollando para que sirvan tanto al sector público-privado como a la sociedad civil para la participación público-privada. Gracias. Thank you, Claudio. I would now like to ask Fulgencio Garrido Ruiz uh, to talk from his perspective in, in relation to humanitarian context. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, I thought I could structure my, um, my pitch to you um, around four issues. Um, basically on the domain and geographical area that I know most, that is the Horn of Africa. Um, it's uh, quite relevant in the sense that uh, the project that the Spanish Cooperation Agency has presented today here, um, uh, it's very much focused in the Horn and uh, a country of great relevance to the work that we do um, uh, under the EU uh, Emergency Trust Fund for Africa, and that's Ethiopia. Um, I would like to give you, if you bear with me, uh, a little context on what is the, the Horn of Africa, the refugee protracted uh, displacement situation in the Horn of Africa, just to give you an idea of how daunting uh, the issue and how challenging and complex the refugee issue is. Uh, then uh, I would like to mention a few issues, challenges for the provision of durable solutions to refugees in the Horn of Africa. Um, just to give you an uplift uh, uh, view as well, to uh, um, give you what, is, uh, what we think in the European Union is a moment of opportunity that has been created towards giving, uh, or providing, or helping contribute to the provision of those durable solutions. And finally, a number of steps that the European Union, together with uh, other international partners, are taking in order to, uh, to respond to that moment of, of opportunity that is being created. Um, I'll give you a, a, a development uh, perspective, not a humanitarian, um, um, because I think what we are discussing here is durable solutions, and for that you need a long-term perspective. Uh, 
um, based not on the model that perhaps has prevailed in the past years that is humanitarian, but also recognizing that uh, we need a long-term perspective for refugees and that at the end of the day, refugees is inherently a political issue. Uh, let's not uh, forget that uh, these are issues that uh, are very sensitive for the uh, hosting countries and therefore it must be treated first and foremost politically. Um, but on the context, very quickly, to tell you what region, uh, the Horn of Africa is uh, afflicted with a lot of fragility. If you look at the eight countries that define the Horn of Africa region, all of them top the, the, uh, or rank among the 20 uh, most fragile countries in the, in the fragility index. And you have uh, within the top five, you have three countries of the Horn of Africa. You have Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan. Um, that gives you an idea of, uh, of what is the, the, the fragility context uh, in the region. Conflict is very pervasive and takes uh, shape in many different forms. You have uh, uh, interstate conflict, uh, like simmering tensions between Ethiopia and Eritrea, between Eritrea and Djibouti. You have civilian conflict, you have civil wars ravaging Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia. Um, you have proxy wars uh, played by uh, uh, different countries in third countries, like Uganda and Sudan in South Sudan. And then you have uh, intercommunal conflict. This is a region that is awash with the small weapons. And um, um, there's a lot of uh, violence uh, for competition over natural resources. Uh, so in addition to this uh, conflict situation that is very, very pervasive, uh, very violent. The region is also afflicted by other factors, and I think one, uh, one speaker before mentioned it, and that's climate change. This is a huge factor for the displacement of people uh, in the region. Um, it takes the form of uh, 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 rain fails, uh, of failed rains, of drought, of floods, and it's this combination of uh, uh, climate change with poor uh, natural resource management that is leading to a, a, a devastating uh, environmental degradation in the region. You see the studies that has been done over the past years. You see um, World Bank is, uh, is the leading uh, on this. That 50% of the displacement in the Horn of Africa takes place because of climate change. And then the other 50% because of uh, conflict. So it's not just conflict that is uh, making people uh, flee uh, in danger. Um, I have bad news in the sense that uh, the projections are very bleak. Uh, the situation is not going to change. And you see uh, the drought that is currently afflicting, afflicting the, re the region, the, the effects of uh, the Nino in the Horn of Africa. Um, and you see the conflict in South Sudan. It's the flow um, of people fleeing, seeking a safe haven in third countries. is going to continue, mainly from South Sudan and from Somalia. Um, that leads me to the challenges that we see um, in this region. Um, one is of protraction. Refugees are there for generations. Uh, you see the camps in Djibouti, Toloado in Ethiopia, Shire, you look at uh, Dabad in Kenya. These are people that have been displaced and uh, retained within camps for more than 20 years. And they don't have any prospect that the situation is going to, uh, to change. Um, while the countries of the region, they have been very, very generous, and that's something to emphasize, the likes of Kenya, Ethiopia, Djibouti, Uganda, they have been very generous in opening their borders and provide protection to those fleeing conflict from South Sudan, Somalia, etc. They have pursued very different policies, and that makes the response of the international community very difficult. If you look at a country like uh, uh, Uganda, right now the largest hosting refugee uh, country in Africa, it has a very progressive policy. Uh, it gives plots of land to refugees so that they can push self-reliance opportunities. But then if you look at other countries like uh, uh, Ethiopia, like Djibouti, uh, parts of Kenya, Sudan, the policies that they push are not that progressive. And uh, basically they follow what we call an incumbent policy. It's that those uh, refugees, uh, they don't have the opportunity to uh, move out of the camps. They don't have access to the formal economy. They don't have access to jobs. They don't have access to uh, education opportunities. And that, of course, curtail their uh, stunt, their, uh, their development. This is a challenge that uh, 
we need to break. That's why I said that uh, it's also a political issue. We need to see how uh, the countries of the region can adopt policies that are uh, introduce refugees in national development plans. That's, uh, that's a key in order to provide durable solutions. Uh, as a result of these uh, regressive policies, if I call it like this, the response of the international community has also been uh, uh, deficient if I can call it this way, it has been short term, it has been humanitarian, and has not look, uh, has not have a, a forward looking perspective. And in a way, uh, uh, we can say that uh, as it is right now, the, the financing model for refugees, as it stands now, we could call it broken, uh, in the sense that uh, it's not sustainable at all. It's not a uh, multi-year, it's not a uh, long term, it's just on an annual basis providing a camp-based assistance um, I mentioned before that there was a moment of opportunity and that's at political level and this is where we have to capitalize and try to get it. Uh, the speakers mentioned before uh, the United Nations General Assembly back in September 2016 and how refugees was put at the top of, uh, of the UNGA agenda. The following day uh, in New York, uh, Obama calls a World Refugee Summit where the countries of the region in the Horn of Africa make in unilaterally a number of pledges. They said, let's provide access to the refugees, for the refugees to the formal economies. Let's increase the quality and quantity of education uh, in camps. Let's uh, provide them with free movement of people. And those pledges um, uh, is, uh, is something uh, that we have not seen for, for a long time. And, uh, I think uh, actors like us, uh, we have to see how we can accompany those pledges in a way that we can fulfill mutual commitments. Somebody talked before also about uh, international border sharing. It's how we can accompany the pledges that these governments are, are making with uh, um, uh, support from the international community for their implementation. The many, uh, in the region, there has been other uh, um, uh, political statements uh, uh, very recently. That was uh, the Mogadishu declaration in, in February this year when President Farmayo of Somalia was warning the, the region, heads of government, pledge that in the face of the droughts that affect the Horn of Africa, they would keep the borders open, they would continue providing asylum space, and they would enhance cooperation on a host of issues like security, like trade, development, etc. Um, there was a head of state summit of IGAD, the regional organization in Nairobi uh, in March 2000, uh, this year, where uh, they agreed on a, on a comprehensive plan of action in order to support uh, durable solutions for Somali refugees, but uh, amount to one million uh, in, the, in the region. So I think for us development uh, practitioners, humanitarian practitioners, the question is how we can capitalize on this political uh, momentum that is very rare and how we not let go this opportunity. Um, very briefly on what the EU is doing, uh, since 2015, migratory crisis uh, came in, uh, we are uh, very engaged in what is um, the, the, the migration crisis. And, uh, um, the fund that I'm managing, uh, the window for the Horn of Africa, is part of a wider trust fund. Uh, it's an instrument that was uh, set up uh, at the Valletta uh, Migration Summit uh, back in uh, November 2015, and that tells the tale of what this trust fund is. It's a trust fund for migration. And one aspect that uh, we cover is international uh, protection and how we can provide long-term solutions to the mm -hmm. plight. Um, of refugees, uh, only in 2016 we have invested a total of uh, 130 million in the region of the Horn of Africa, uh, not only in camps but also for the host communities that are uh, that are hosting them, and, and bearing the brand of providing those refugees with uh, basic services. Um, two concepts that are important for me to underline here is uh, the comparative advantage and the international border sharing. It's a comparative advantage in the sense that uh, uh, we cannot reasonably expect in the current political context of the European Union for durable solutions that is resettlement in, uh, in, in 
countries like, uh, like those of the European Union. Um, what we expect as a mutual commitment is that those refugees can be hosted uh, at the closest proximity to what is their, uh, their original home, because it's there that they are going to find uh, uh, living standards that were as close as possible to those that they have before they have to flee danger in the first place. But that carries also a mutual responsibility from the international community, and that's the, the international border sharing, is how we can help those countries that are hosting them um, to, to bear the brunt of, uh, to, uh, to provide those basic services, to open their economy to the refugees so that they can become an active uh, player uh, in the growth, uh, in the economic growth of those countries. Um, two things very important here to, to mention is one, uh, grant financing is not going to save the day. That's a drop in the ocean whether it's from humanitarians and from developments. And this is where international financial institutions and the private sector, they play a huge role in this regard. Um, these are the kind of partners we have to, uh, to look at how the likes of the World Bank, the likes of the IMF can get engaged in these countries to provide a conducive environment for the provision of those responses. But also how we can engage in country, uh, with the private sector in these countries. Even a country like Somalia, 90% of the economy is made by the private sector, how we can engage with them. And then a final point on domestic revenue mobilization. That's the, that's the key to it. It's how we can bring those countries uh, to rise revenue, because that's the key for them to, for security to take root and then for uh, services to be provided to their own population and then to the, to the refugees. It cannot be that countries like uh, in the Horn put again the example of Somalia, the budget is only made of grant financing and remittances, and then zero is coming from taxing. That's a, that's a mentality that we also as development practitioners have to look at and see how we can break that, uh, um, that dynamics that are negative for, for the economic development of these countries and for the responses to the refugees. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Fulgencio. I would now like to ask uh, Kelly Genet from the Norwegian Refugee Council to start your intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Lida. Um, first, thank you very much to Alliance Achere and to the ICID for inviting us today, uh, together with my colleague uh, Solomon, who came from Ethiopia for the occasion. Um, we are very happy to be here to discuss uh, humanitarian partnerships. Unfortunately, my Spanish is too limited, so I will uh, keep in it, uh, the speech in English, uh, but I'm working on it. Um, so, so very briefly um, about humanitarian partnerships and building them. The key factors that need to be taken into account when uh, building a a partnership from from NRC perspective there would be two um, two main points the, the first one would be to consider the diversity of partners that may have to work together uh, diversity of partners means uh, bringing different visions different experiences different areas of expertise different backgrounds uh, so basically we just pick a different language and this can make gaps in understanding, can make the, um, the coordination very demanding or very difficult. Uh, it's like, for instance, bringing together people from the emergency uh, and uh, development actors. It's just two complete different worlds that are meeting and uh, the coordination is, is very important, difficult but crucial to make sure that um, we ensure a successful transition. So this kind of partnership can be very rewarding if we manage to overcome uh, those challenges and uh, uh, maintain a smooth coordination. It has to be rewarding for all partners, but um, it also, most importantly, it has to be for the beneficiaries. 
Um, it's also important, and this would be my, my second point, to keep in mind that uh, we are coming to this partnership with different objectives. Some of us might be uh, for profit, I'm thinking about the business community here, um, some of us will be not for profit, uh, so every partner needs to find uh, something to get something out of this partnership, of course. Um, but what we all want, all want at the end is to um, how we can provide solutions to the people in need. So how do we promote this kind of partnership? Well, NRC experience in partnership is uh, quite recent, but well spread through international media, social media. Our Secretary General uh, Yann Eglin was recently in Kenya to uh, meet the business community and discuss a partnership that we have in uh, uh, Dadaab refugee camp. Huh? So um, Fulgencio was talking about Kenya. Um, well. Dada Refugee Camp is the, is the biggest uh, uh, human, uh, refugee camp in the world. So uh, we're we have developed this partnership with Safaricom to, for refugees who sign up for computer uh, classes. And this allows us to provide them with uh, online educational resources. So, um, so we're not doing enough to promote those partnership. And of course, we want to do more. Um, but, our, but in the end, uh, what really matters is not really NRC, it's no, not the partners either, uh, it's the impact that we have on the field. Um, how this partnership can improve people's daily life, how can we really change something? And I think that when the impact is there, uh, when a partnership is successful, then it naturally spreads fast and far. So um, how, can, how can we make it sustainable um, when we have a successful partnership? I think that as for any humanitarian program outcomes, uh, the question of ownership by the people who will benefit from it the involvement of the community, of the lo local authorities, of any other local stakeholder is key. Uh, because they are the ones who will remain uh, and we will leave. So our responsibility as humanitarian uh, partners is um, to anticipate on upcoming issues. Uh, we were talking earlier of maintenance, uh, uh, knowledge of transfer to, um, uh, to the people who will own the project. Um, it's our responsibility to ensure the capacity building so that when we leave, they are well equipped, basically, um, to make the partnership outcomes sustainable. So I mentioned already the, this partnership we have in Kenya. I would mention maybe uh, and, and finish with that uh, just another partnership that uh, uh, we have developed. Um, um, with universities of law and uh, um, legal firms mostly. So NRC have been providing legal assistance uh, um, in 20 conflict affected uh, countries um, to displace people, to help them uh, to pursue and claim for their rights. Uh, so in Middle East, we are, um, for instance, partnering with the law firm uh, Dentons uh, who provides pro bono legal counsel to refugees in Jordan, uh, Lebanon, and Iraq. And it's this kind of partnership, not only material, but um, uh, knowledge, expertise in, in one sector that we're looking forward to, to develop. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. We're moving nicely from the broad towards the specific, and I would now like to invite Daphne Carlier from the Safe Access to Fuel and Energy Program of the World Food Program to share her points of view on partnership building. Thank you, Daphne. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, indeed, my name is Daphne Carlier, and I work for the World Food Program, where I'm coordinating 18 of our safe programs. 
I want to thank the organizers from this event, all the panelists and everyone here to uh, join us in this conversation, a very important conversation that I'm very excited uh, for it um, taking place today. And I'm very happy I can be here to share more of the work WFP has been doing on energy and how we are working uh, in partnerships on this specific topic. Um, I want to provide a bit of background on uh, why WFP is involved in this area of energy. As uh, UNHCR already said in the first session, they're not an energy agency, neither is WFP. We're a humanitarian agency, but we do realize that energy impacts all of the efforts and all of our day-to-day -day operations and the objectives that WFP is trying to accomplish, meaning ending world hunger and achieving food security. And if we know that 95% of the staple foods um, that we are distributing requires cooking, also knowing that millions and millions of people face challenges every day to uh, obtain cooking fuel and energy to actually prepare those meals. Energy is not something we can, um, we can skip. Energy is something that really needs to be addressed. What we have seen is um, if people do not have access to cooking energy specifically, they will uh, skip their meals, they will undercook their food with a lot of health uh, concerns, uh, or they will sell part of the food rations that we provide to actually obtain cooking fuel, often firewood of charcoal. Now, given that energy um, impacts all aspects of food security from actually being able to prepare it, but also to, through um, livelihoods, uh, meaning that they might not have an income to purchase food themselves or their agricultural practices due to deforestation of the high dependency of firewood. WFP started with its SAFE program in 2009. And this is a program that is really working together with communities and local partners to develop um, uh, programs that address their energy uh, needs through energy related and, and livelihood related activities. And we're currently in 18 countries worldwide um, and have reached 6 million people with an ambitious goal to reach 10 million people by 2020. Now, our priority under this program is first and foremost to, to enable the people to benefit from the food that we provide. And this program follows a, a cross-cutting, uh, tailored approach in each of the areas and countries that we work in. Um, and in in able to do that, um, if we're able to do that, we need to depend on partnerships in each of these areas that we work. Now, when we look at the ambitious goal of uh, ambitious goals of the 2030 agenda, um, um, including SD2 to, to end hunger and achieve food security, um, we are dependent on the establishing and maintaining very strong relationship with government partners, with civil society, with private sector, um, with communities itself, um, with academia, um, uh, United Nations agencies and NGOs. And we are, since we have started in 2009, we're working more and more towards filling the gaps uh, of expertise that we have in this area with finding really relevant, um, effective and efficient partnerships in this area. And one of the, uh, or the areas that we look at to find these uh, partnerships that help us to implement strong programs is that we look at um, combining and leveraging resources um, and complementary activities amongst partners. We, of course, have to look at finding mutually beneficial um, uh, partnerships that do, does not only benefit us and the community, but also the partners we work with. Um, and we are looking at finding partnerships that allow us to, to achieve outcomes that we could not be able to do by ourselves as effectively or as innovatively. Um, the good thing, uh, the good news is that um, there are a growing number of organizations working in this field on energy, um, it, let it be humanitarian agencies or private sectors that could really um, open up the doors for more and better partnerships. The partnerships that WFP engages in, in this area specifically, is, is looking at increased effectiveness, um, so finding and creating more appropriate and relevant programs, 
um, energy solutions are not uh, a one-size-fits-all solution. So in each area that we work, we really have to figure out what are the cultural preferences, what are the resources available, what are the structures that allow us to implement certain activities, and for that we need local partners uh, to work with. We also look at cost efficiency. Um, reducing costs, very important, especially in the humanitarian field, um, allowing to share resources, um, and avoiding duplication. And avoiding duplication, I will got, get back on a little bit later. Um, of course, uh, innovation is a very important area that we would look at. Um, finding new solutions by looking at it from different angles for different kinds of organizations. It really can help us come up with uh, new ways to address the same uh, challenges again. And especially this, this very location specific and technical nature of the activities that we're working, of these energy um, uh, stove and fuel solutions, um, it requires specialists and capacity. And this is often capacities that we as humanitarian agencies do not have, um, as we are, again, not a, an, an energy agency. So without finding these essential skills to design good and strong programs, we're actually doing the people we help a disservice by providing them uh, maybe not qualitative, not relevant um, solutions. Now, um, better coordination amongst partners will not only um, um, provide us with the expertise that we need, but is, um, it, it will also offer better services um, and align current standalone programs to form well-aligned complementary uh, uh, programs for the people we help. Now, one of the um, examples that I wanted to come back on when it, when it comes to duplication is I just, I just got back from uh, Burundi, a country where um, energy, especially cooking energy, is, is really uh, difficult. There's massive deforestation. Uh, people are not able to cook in some areas five days out of the month while they do have access to food. And in order to address that, we saw a number of uh, organizations, NGOs, um, um, uh, UN agencies, uh, institutions, working in parallel but not jointly on addressing these issues, meaning that there were a number of initiatives that just were not well coordinated. Um, and sometimes uh, that means that there's duplication, and that means that one of the, that each other's programs can actually interfere if a private sector is working on raising awareness and establishing a market for people to have access to cook stove technologies, while at the same time a humanitarian organization is maybe subsidizing and disseminating stoves and fuel, that actually is counter-effective. So again, that underlines the need for partnership. And I wanna end with an, an example that I think um, touches very closely on what uh, the Alliance here is doing and, and, and that can address all of these concerns with the lack of partnership in this area. And that is the SAFE uh, Global Working Group. And that uh, the SAFE is Safe Access to Fuel and Energy and this is a consortium of partners um, including currently chairing as WFP, FAO and a Global Alliance of Clean Cook Stoves, but also has partners such as uh, IOM, UNHCR is involved, Mercy Corps, uh, Kupi and a lot of other uh, partners that at the global level share tried and tested methods, research, um, areas of work, expertise, provides a platform to find the right partners. And one of the, the um, opportunities we see there, and then I will bring it back to Burundi, is to to leverage this, um, this example of partnerships among so many, many uh, organizations and institutions and um, develop this also at the national level. So as I was explaining that there were some challenges in implementing these energy um, activities in, in Burundi where there was overlap and duplication and people were not very well informed on what they were doing, um, they're now working on establishing a national safe working group that will work together with the communities, with the government, with the agencies there to not only um, avoid duplication, share costs and resources, but also allow them to jointly find the expertise and the capacity and the skills um, that is now lacking. Um, 
that is one of the ways we're looking forward to, to uh, promote uh, collaboration amongst our work in multiple countries that we are, that we are working. And um, I think the uh, Alianza Gire is a great example that we hopefully soon can uh, showcase uh, amongst the SAFE uh, Global Working Group as well. And I want to congratulate everyone involved in this on the amazing work. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Daphne. And last but by no means least, I would like to invite Maria Jesus Vega to talk about partnership from the point of view of the United Nations uh, High Commission for Refugees here in Spain, which has been a very close partner with the Alianza Shire. Thank you very much. Um, Bueno, yo no soy la persona que iba a estar aquí representando a ACNUR Ginebra, como estaréis viendo en el, en el programa, soy española, eh, con estos expertos en, en energía, eh, pero bueno, pues hay que decir que hay tres personas en la unidad de energía en Ginebra, hay diez a nivel mundial y con eso yo creo que pues ya damos una idea de cómo está el sector, ¿no? Mejorando, pero, pero así, ¿no? Entonces, bueno, esperamos que en algún momento puedan venir, sin duda ninguna, y tener la oportunidad de charlar con vosotros. Lo que sí puedo decir es que he tenido también el, la suerte de haber participado en, en la gestación del proyecto, de esta alianza, eh, cuando AECIT nos vino a la oficina a proponer, eh, bueno, pues eh, hacer algo conjunto para mejorar el acceso a la energía junto con los cerebros de la Universidad Politécnica, junto con expertos de, del sector privado. Y bueno, pues yo acostumbrada a trabajar con solicitantes de asilo en el aspecto social, psicológico o legal, pues, eh, pues esto era evidentemente un reto y un campo nuevo eh, al que, en el que trabajar desde, desde España, aunque es un campo muy necesario en el que Agnur viene trabajando en, en muchos países. Yo he aprendido muchísimo en el proceso, no me he convertido en ninguna experta en montaje de biodigestores ni en esas redes de baja intensidad con cables trenzados, pero he aprendido mucho de la complementariedad de mandatos, de la riqueza de, de trabajar en, en alianzas, de la importancia de definir roles y responsabilidades de los distintos ritmos y estilos de trabajar con sector público, con privado, con académicos, con humanitarios, de la importancia de ser flexibles eh, y de ir con una mentalidad abierta para trabajar con personas de distintas culturas en distintos países, de la necesidad de compartir recursos, ganas, tiempo e ilusión en estos proyectos, de la importancia de tener a personas clave en lugares clave, que hacen que las cosas ocurran. Eh, realmente lo, lo ha comentado antes la representante, necesitamos más manos, necesitamos más cabezas, necesitamos recursos, necesitamos aliados, eh, yo creo que toda la comunidad humanitaria, para poder responder a las necesidades de 65 millones de personas, un número que crece cada día. Y, eh, Tengamos en cuenta que si no respondemos en el lugar donde están los refugiados, los refugiados van a continuar, igual que las personas desplazadas por otros motivos, por motivos económicos, van a continuar buscando lugares en los que poder vivir en seguridad y tener a salvo sus vidas, como estamos viendo ahora mismo en el Mediterráneo, donde eh, bueno, pues con las cifras de la semana pasada superamos ya los 1.500 muertos, ahogados, el año pasado fueron 5.000, Y seguimos viendo cómo la mayor carga sigue estando en los países más pobres del planeta, como Etiopía, como Uganda, que acogen al 86% de la población de refugiados a nivel mundial. Yo ahora lo que voy a hacer es que voy a continuar en inglés, porque así me lo han, me lo han pedido, para hacer un poco un resumen de los beneficios de las, de las energías limpias eh, en contexto de, de desplazamiento forzoso. Eh, muchos de estos eh, beneficios ya se han ido desgranando a lo largo de la, de la jornada, así que va a ser un poco pues, un, un resumen. Y lo voy a leer para ahorrar tiempo, porque ya he debido consumir pues, un minuto o dos de los, que tengo, de los siete que tengo asignados. Ok, so there is a long list of benefits of clean energy. First, I'll say provide a safer asylum space for refugees 
reduce sexual and gender-based violence incidents related to firewood collection, increase economic outputs and provide business and employment opportunities for refugees and communities, increase time available for education and livelihood de development, and empower women who would have less drudgery and greater time available for more productive and enjoyable activities. Improve health by dramatically reducing smoke inhalation. We've been talking about that in the first morning session. Children and women are disproportionately affected. Indoor air pollution from the use of solid fuel accounts for nearly four million deaths each year, which is four times as many as the malaria uh, provokes. Lower risk of burns due to fire, um, to open fires. It also benefits minimizing deforestation and environmental damage in camps and surrounding, surrounding areas, as well as lower carbon emissions. Prompt cultural changes and increased use of clean fuels within host community populations. Improve cooperation and peaceful coexistence with host communities. Provide employment opportunities for refugees in the sales, operation, and maintenance of energy, goods, and services. Money saving due to increased use of sustainable systems and technologies that would reduce operational cost of humanitarian organizations, allowing scarce resources to be allocated in other areas. Fulfill commitments to carbon neutrality by 2020 and taking steps towards green, the blue, and complement efforts to achieving the 2038 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Government advocacy through attracting international investments and infrastru in infrastructure and minimizing environmental impacts. And then increase engagement with private sector, academic, and interagency coordination. If you allow me a little bit more, I'll give like six key messages um, that we feel are important as well. First one will be clean energy saves lives. We've been talking that 1.2, 1.3 billion people worldwide do not have access to electricity. And then that almost 10 million forcibly displaced people are living in camp setting. Most of them we have without minimal access to energy for cooking, lighting, education, livelihoods, health. Universal access to clean, affordable, and reliable energy should vastly improve the health and well-being of millions of persons and it should be an integral part of a humanitarian response, an essential factor in creating sustainable economic development. Second message is partnerships are key. Humanitarian agencies need to reduce their operational costs, particularly as they spend over 100 millions operating diesel generators to produce electricity. We must recognize that energy is not currently treated as a priority and it is not planned coherently in the humanitarian system. But it is recognized that a most sustainable approach is required. Humanitarian agencies do not have, we do not have adequate re resources or expertise to address the huge scale of energy needs. A strong partnerships, a strong coordination, sustainable actions, with public, private, academic sector, other UN agencies, entities, and specialized NGOs, and host communities and refugees are essential to provide solutions and improve people's daily lives, and to build institutional capacity and develop comprehensive energy policies. UNHCR is developing global partnerships with different partners, um, beyond Alianza Chile, with the Swiss Energy for Development and Cooperation, the Danish Technical University, Berkeley Air, MIT and Sustainable Energy for All, IKEA Foundation, Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, and the Moving Energy Initiative. 
UNHCR develop a global safe access to fuel and energy, a safe strategy that the colleague from the World Food Program has mentioned in 2014 to, stream, to mainstream energy in, in, um, as a cross-cutting issue across all UNHCR operation and it's been revised in the operations in Chad, Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Jordan, Kenya, Rwanda, Sudan, Uganda. Ongoing now in Nepal, South Sudan, and Tanzania. The third message is investment in clean energy will reap significant dividends for refugees and host communities. Long-term planning and investment is essential. And um, okay, you, you, many of you know that now some of the first businesses to be established in emergency context are the phone charging, the fuel sales, the lighting, followed by an electricity um, generation. Due to the protracted nature of many displacement crises, investments are being made for infrastructural development and clean energy in places where the governments would allow us to do it. In some countries, we are not allowed to, to, to place and to build infrastructures that could have like a permanent um, vision. Um, we have just developed in, with the IKEA Foundation uh, solar farms and solar power plants in, in Jordan. And then finishing, full message is UNHCR promotes cash-based assistance and market-based approaches to increase access to energy. Fifth one is refugees and host communities must be at the center, must be empowered through their full participation in planning, training, and implementing energy programs. Then it's important to use a bottom-up um, innovation to create ideas and locally appropriate interventions. Let's not forget that women and youth are essential there. And then the last one is effective energy interventions must be backed up by evidence-based data and be sustainable, as Carlos Matais was mentioning this morning. Relevant and reliable data allows us to demonstrate results and highlight obstacles while increasing transparency and accountability. Monitoring and evaluation tools are essential. Detailed data on energy use, refugees consume power and preferences, equipment, efficiencies, and cost is key to evaluate the effectiveness of interventions. So we have just begun, and we need to build on all the successful experiences to date, and we hope to count on all of you for facing the challenges with the refugee and displaced population. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. So thank you very much to our five uh, speakers. I think you've given us a very rich overview of some of the issues that need to be taken into account when we work in partnership, but particularly in humanitarian context in relation to energy and refugees. All of you seem to have identified innovation, the cross-cutting nature of the issues that are being dealt with, the fact that we need approaches that are tailored to specific contexts, that the private sector has an important role in these partnership relationships, and perhaps the most important of all, that the populations that we are working with need to play a central role in these collaborative or partnership mechanisms. I'm going to hand over in a moment to Alejandra to uh, develop a moderation session with our front row speakers and the panel. But before I do that, if I could briefly summarize what seem to be the key messages from each of you. You can correct me if I'm wrong. This may assist you when you do your feedback. Claudio uh, has reinforced the importance of a definition for partnership, people first, the long-term nature of partnership. The private sector role that is important for financing, but financing and beyond, not just money. The private sector has a range of other issues to uh, support partnership, and that we need a framework for working partnership and roadmaps. 
Fulgencio talked and gave us a very rich taste, I think, of the, the context that um, we are dealing with in the Horn of Africa and the importance of contextual sensitivity and looking to the interconnection between politics, climate change, and security. He also stressed that this should be an opportunity as well as um, the importance of taking into account political accountability and political level action. Kelly uh, discussed very nicely the ingredients that are important at the time of developing partnerships. Diversity, the link which I think is hugely important between development and humanitarian actors. Um, different incentives for partnering and taking those into account, and again, the impact on the ground. Daphne reinforced energy as a cross-cutting issue, the importance of sustainable livelihoods, tailored approaches, capacity, and how do we share lessons to avoid duplication. And Maria Jesus, I think, has given us some very important practical indications of putting people at the center, recognizing complementarity in roles and responsibilities, the time issue, the importance of clean energy, and again, this cross-cutting idea of gender, education, health, economy, the importance of planning, coordination, and results-based evidence as we proceed ahead. And with that summary, I will now hand over to Alejandra to moderate the rest of the session. Thank you, Lida, for this um, quick summary. And thank you so much to the panel for the interesting intervention. We'd like now to invite our front, four front row guests to join the discussion with, uh, with the panel. So uh, allow me to introduce them first. Uh, we have today with us uh, Mar Maestre from the, the Institute of Development and Studies, Sussex University. And she's an expert on business and development. Uh, Marta Marano Medina, she's the Director of Institutional Relations and partner, Strategic Partnership uh, in the Ayuda en Acción. Um, Francisco Rey, Co-Director of uh, Instituto de Estudios sobre Conflicto de Acción Humanitaria. And Solomon Acerfa, he's uh, the Livelihoods uh, Program Coordinator in Ethiopia with N NRC, Norwegian Refugee Council in Ethiopia. So we want to keep this part of the session more interactive and we, we will really appreciate any comment or question that you may have uh, to, the, to the panel. So we have the micro there. Um, I will suggest that maybe we can start this time. In the, in the last session, we started from the general approach, and then we were down to the concrete. So maybe this time we can start from the concrete, the, the field vision. So we, maybe we can start with Solomon, if you agree. So micro, other, thanks. Thank you, Alexandra. I'm Solomon. Okay. I'm Solomon. Uh, working for Norwegian Refugee Council in Ethiopia as a food security and livelihood coordinator based in Shire. I'm the one uh, who leading on behalf of NRC to implement this program with Alianza Shire, the Government Contrapart Administration for Refugee and Returning Affairs, and uh, UNHCR. Thank you for Alianza Shire to make it happen for impossible to possible uh, for a Jewish refugee camp uh, electrification program. Uh, having said this, I need to pick up the second presenter regarding the partnership. When you come to the context of Ethiopia, it's, I mean, everything is uh, government controlling and leading implementation process, dynamics, and procedure. Uh, maybe as you are well aware, the second presenter, um, Ethiopia adopted the refugee law in 2004 which is with a lot of limitation. Uh, unlike Uganda and Zambia in Africa, there is no local integration program. It's treating refugee with protracted refugee situation with a state of limbo and everything is under doc control and to give them basic services. Uh, so as to ensure you know, the right of people to live with dignity, to give them I mean, access for right to livelihood and, and protection with the general uh, demand and requirement of UNHCR and international agency, there are a lot of limitations for that. So when you come to practical implementation of which is locally adaptable to have a partnership with the government, you must really discern the invisible dynamics of what you are going to do to have a partnership with them. That's one of the key points 
Alianza Shiri and all stakeholders maybe need to understand in, in our country. Uh, I mean, I don't want to talk more and more about the politics and, and, uh, and uh, the, the um, practical context of the country, but rather when we think of future partnership with our government and with our, I mean, all stakeholders, including UNHCR, we need really, I mean, to consider how we, we, we plan to work together with our government. Uh, thanks to God, I mean, NRC really in the best position now to get a spirit of acceptance and to get a good rep reputation uh, to work with uh, the Ethiopian government. And we are the leading agency in Shire and all over Ethiopia for all the refugees which is, uh, get refugee status and, and treating in Ethiopia. Having said this, also the second point, on September 20, uh, Ethiopian government prime minister pledged nine, nine uh, I think rights of refugee for, for, for uh, to give, to treat them uh, with so many entitlements. Uh, like, I mean, um, so as to ensure the right to livelihood, uh, government pledge uh, to give them, I mean, to secure more than 100,000 of hectare of land to make them not partially sufficient, rather in order to ensure household livelihood security. Also, in terms of right and in the legal status and in terms of, I mean, getting the right uh, documentation, uh, I think the government also pledged now they are under the process of uh, discussion in constitution of uh, constitutional arrangement of uh, the Ethiopian government to give them uh, to participate in industry lead uh, development program. Uh, I think they already secured from the European Union some amount of money for that, and then also to participate more than 100,000 refugees in, in, in the course of I mean, this implementation. This is really a good news. But uh, what I really would like uh, for, I mean, to, to, for Alliance issue to take care of and pick out uh, thinking of uh, implementation of uh, any partnership in Ethiopia uh, it's advisable, really, I mean, to think of what is the invisible dynamics really going on uh, in the country where everything is controlled by the government and they need each and everything uh, which, I mean, uh, to, to be trans transparent and, and knows more and more about less, less and less. Uh, this is one of the points. Uh, the other is uh, maybe... Uh, we had a partnership, tripartite partnership, I think, NRC, UNHCR, and, and uh, uh, also Alianza uh, When you are, I mean, again, to think of this, I mean, a partnership, uh, instead of going through UNHCR, uh, advisable also to invite the government uh, to lead uh, this partnership uh, so that we can have, I mean, uh, a smooth relationship with the government. So this is it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Solomon. I think before the answer from the panel, we can make a first round with the expert from the from the front row. So maybe Marta, you wanna? Should I speak in English? Or whatever, speak whatever you prefer. But yeah. I think if you don't have the audio for the translation, maybe if you don't mind. You I, I can speak in English. Perfect. No Thanks. Um, well, I wanted to do to take three points. First of all, I want to see to mention. What I think from the civil society perspective are the key elements that differentiate this alliance, especially compared with the Spanish examples. So there's one that has been evaluated in Peru and is very different from this one, so uh, I'm able to, to compare both of them. Secondly, I wanted to make some recommendations to improve in, in, uh, in alliances, and mainly these recommendations could be for the, for the agency. Uh, we are now, right now, uh, they are elaborating their new uh, director, director plan, so it's important, it's, in, uh, it's a good moment to, 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 do, to make some recommendations. And finally, I, have, I had a question for, for Kelly. Uh, all right, so as three deep key elements that differentiate this one, I would say, first of all, the involvement, uh, and more than the involvement, is the, the leadership and the coordination of uh, an actor such as the university. 
In the other example I, I mentioned before in Peru, there were only uh, Agencia, this, the Spanish government, and uh, enterprises, uh, enterprises uh, sec private sector and NGOs, but not the university. And I think uh, it's uh, one of the key uh, successful elements because they not only are one, one actor more, but they played an essential role, which, are, which is to, to liderate and to coordinate. It's very, very important. Then, um, it's a congratulations to all the actors, because uh, to do an alliance in a, co in a humanitarian context, it's very, very complex. It's not the same as a development context, and I think it's, um, uh, it's, very, it's, it's a peculiarity of this alliance. And third, um, it's been a very efficient alliance from the economic point of view. It's not have been mentioned. I, th I think, Rafael, you, you, you mentioned it. With, it's been done with uh, very few resources, but it's something to take into account compared, especially with the Peruvian one I was mentioning, which is it was a huge amount of money. No? And the results of these ones, the impact for me, it's very, very impressive. Um, then, uh, as recommendations for, for, from, the spi from the civil society point of view, I would say that uh, I would encourage the agency to promote more uh, alliances as, like this one in their new plan di director plan. The other plan uh, d developed an instrument to do, but we have very few ex examples, the Mexican, Mexican, the Peruvian, this one, and we need more, more and better ones. Um, secondly, um, I think that this alliance could, could is, has been very efficient from the economic point of view, as I said, but it could be more efficient from the timing uh, element. It could have been done in, in, in less time. And for that, the agency may play a key role if they help with this complex uh, difficulty in, from the institutional point of view that Carlos mentioned before. Um, so I think the agency can help a lot uh, as a facilitator, not only for um, um, putting money, but uh, being an actor that facilitates all this institutional architecture. Um, this is it, ju I'm just say saying it to, to improve a little bit. No? Um, third point, I'm, I'm almost finishing. I think uh, the, um, it's good that at the end, the Norwegian, Norwegian Refugee Council entered into alliances, and I think this is very positive for the sustainability. If we want to increase this sustainability, we need to include more um, NGOs that are operating in the field, and that cannot, uh, can guarantee and accompanying the, the population. For once the alliance is finished, they, they need some more time, and this is a key issue for the sustainable elements. And finally, I agree with Maria Jesus that it's uh, very, and with Carlos, um, that it, to do uh, evaluation. And I think that here we have, if this is a very replicable alliance, and I'm sure this is only the beginning of more uh, alliances like this one. The, the, um, and I think that you have all the elements to do an impact evaluation. You can have a, a control group uh, that has not been benefited, and one, and, and compare, because you're taking already all the data that you need. Um, and so I, I, I really encourage because when you when you do evaluations you learn and then you improve for the next ones and all the people here we, we are learning a lot from this experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marta. Oh, and my question to Kelly. There's, there's only I, I really liked your intervention. There's only one thing I didn't agree is that you say that um, all the actors had different objectives. And I think that it's, it's probably it's true, and it's one it's part of this diversity you were mentioning. But I think that when you you, you have a even if you have a different objective, but we have when you have a same a, a joint vision of what the alliance uh, objectives, general objectives are, and what you want to achieve together, then uh, it's better. Yeah, this I learned from the evaluation of the Peruvian um, um, alliance, where all the actors had worked like. In, in separate separate boxes without a, a, a joint vision, and uh, I think that here I see more joint vi more joint vision. Perhaps you could explain me more what you really meant with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we keep going, yeah, Mar. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Mar Maestre, and I work at the Business and Development Center in the Institute of Development Studies in the UK, and. Well, I'll try to be brief. I wanted to have a bit of a reflection on kind of how the international debate on 
public-private partnerships and business and state relations, I think, fit into this example of the alliance and, and the debate we, we are having right now, because I think it's very, very relevant. And I'm very happy this conversation is also happening here as well as in other places. We, at IDS, we've been working on this area for several years, and we've seen, maybe I'll start from the problems, we've seen that the types of problems we're facing as everyone has explained, they, they go from access to energy, but they also go to protection, gender-based violence, migration, livelihood opportunities. They are all linked to each other, and they are all the interventions or actions you do in one area will affect all the others as well. So these are all very systemic issues and very complex, so where not one actor alone will be able to find a solution. So this is where these alliances and these networks gain importance and relevance. And that's why we have to think about not just well, what is the role of the government or what is the role of the private sector, it's actually what are our roles together and what can we learn from each other and how can we collaborate better? Because otherwise we're not gonna get anywhere. And I think this is where Alianza Shira, it's, it's a good example of how to start a conversation and how to build on that and, and build on different expertise, different incentives for the different actors, and, and make sure you, you manage to collaborate together. Um, we've seen a growth in public-private partnerships. I work a lot on the food and agriculture sector, and I think in the last five years, there are from multi-stakeholder platforms to public-private partnerships. There has been like something like 50 different international ones newly created, not taking into account the small, maybe kind of partnerships that happen in country, which is a very sudden and very big growth. It shows how governments, how private sector, how again everyone is interested and in trying to learn how to do it better. But I think we're lacking examples like Alianza Shire that show how they actually work. Because as it has been explained, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to talk with everyone. It takes a lot of time. It's different languages we're speaking as other people are talking about. And it requires commitment from everyone, but also requires the capacity to adapt and to be flexible and to listen to each other and say, well, this is failing. Well, let's try another approach, which is something I think all of us are a bit, are not used to doing. And it's, it's quite complex to say, well, we're trying new approaches and we have to be aware of that. So it's. It's, I think, those elements that probably today have not been very explicit, but I think have happened. And maybe if you could, from the panel, you have experience on how to be more adaptive and maybe even how to use data to learn from it, to, to change the course of the partnerships at, at some point, I think will be really interesting. Something that I, I've seen, I think, almost everyone has mentioned, and, and we've also seen, it's really, really important. It's, the engagement of the communities from the beginning, not underestimate the people we are working with and we're working for, but also with, and the knowledge they have, the capacities they have, they are the ones that know what they need, what they require. And I think also often they'll, working all together will allow us to see what well, we're giving access to energy, but then that energy can be used for a school or for a productive use, so how, what parallel kind of interventions can happen at the same time to, to be able to leverage on those impacts and, and kind of work more on that. And yeah, I think I'll stop there. I have examples, but. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. So I, the last one. Hola, buenos días. Quiero que hablaré en español. Creo que es bueno mejor para mí y bueno, bastante mejor para ustedes. <laughs> <laughs> Porque mi inglés es bastante rusty. Bueno. Sin problema. Bueno, muchas gracias por la invitación y bueno, enhorabuena por la alianza y enhorabuena a Carlos por tu fidelidad al sector y por seguir dando y bueno, y bueno proponiendo cosas innovadoras como, y bueno con tu equipo. Yo quería hacer alguna referencia solo que nos permitiera situar también, el, y se ha citado varias veces, la Cumbre Mundial Humanitaria que finalizó justo hace un año eh, bueno, en Estambul como hito fundamental en la toma de conciencia por parte de los humanitarios de la necesidad de las alianzas público-privadas. Creo que eso es verdad y creo que hay que reconocer creo que se ha insinuado bueno, en la mesa, que así como los actores de desarrollo han sido pues, uno más abiertos a este tema, pues, los actores humanitarios lo hemos sido menos. ¿Por qué? 
eh, pues en primer lugar, por los contextos de actuación. Y creo que la intervención que ha hecho Salomón viene muy al caso. Los eh, contextos de actuación donde se desenvuelve la, la acción humanitaria son contextos especialmente convulsos, por definición, y son bueno, contextos muy volátiles, muy frágiles, donde cualquier actuación puede politizarse, creo que los ejemplos que, bueno, por lo que ha puesto él son excelentes, y eso ha hecho que muchas veces pues, en los actores humanitarios, tal vez por un exceso de celo o de… no sabría cómo llamarlo, no hemos facilitado la, eh, la presencia de otros actores, bueno, por pensar que somos nosotros, y bueno, perdonen la ironía, los que tenemos el, eh, el monopolio del bien, de la imparcialidad, del, del, del trabajo con las comunidades, de que todo hay que hacerlo con neutralidad, todo este tipo de cosas. Pero bromas aparte, creo que parte de verdad en esto hay. Los contextos humanitarios exigen a todos los actores que quieran trabajar en ellos cierto respeto a ciertas normas, tanto éticas como jurídicas, que no todos tienen por qué respetar. Y, y, pues, pues, y por supuesto, pues, las empresas pueden no, eh, no tener interés en eso. Pero creo que, que es importante reconocer que hay grandes experiencias de, de violencias público-privadas en el tema de los desastres producidos por, por, por amenazas naturales, pero muchas menos en eh, contextos eh, de conflicto por esto que estaba citando, por la complejidad de la actuación y por la exigencia de ciertos límites eh, eh, pues al actuar eh, de las instituciones. Dicho esto, creo que la cumbre humanitaria se abrió bastante a esto, considerando que, y creo que se ha dicho pues, pues, en la intervención inicial del secretario de Estado, frente a concepciones un poco anticuadas de mera responsabilidad social corporativa, eh, lo que había que aprovechar es el core eh, de, las, de las empresas y su verdadero saber hacer, sea en logística, sea en agua, sea en energía o, o, o sea en lo que fuera. Yo creo que ahí la cumbre sí que ha sido un paso adelante de romper estas, entre comillas, virginidades humanitarias y, pues, y saber y, bueno, abrirse a otras. En segundo lugar, quería hacer una, una reflexión muy, muy breve sobre la necesidad de adaptación del saber de las empresas a estos contextos. En el ámbito de la cooperación española ya ha habido algunas experiencias en el pasado, en eh, de alianzas público-privadas, algunas exitosas en el ámbito humanitario y otras menos exitosas. En los años 80, los más viejos del lugar se acordarán, o en los 90, tras el huracán Mitch, en la cooperación española hubo algún iluminado que, bueno, que hablaba de soluciones llave en mano. A las emergencias teníamos que ir con soluciones llave en mano y las plantas potabilizadoras debían ser estándar y tal. Y algunos que hay en la sala pues, pues conocerán cómo incluso tras el huracán Mitch hubo algunos sonoros fracasos de plantas que no estaban dimensionadas, tal, tal, tal. Entonces, creo que esta adaptación, que las empresas, por supuesto, conocen perfectamente, eh, a los eh, contextos de actuación eh, pues es fundamental, y pongo énfasis también en algo que, que han dicho todos los compañeros y compañeras antes, de la participación de las entidades locales en esta adaptación, de, en la incorporación pues, de saberes autóctonos, de temas culturales, bueno, todo este tipo de cosas. Y, en segundo lugar, el aprovechamiento, creo que, que bueno, se conoce ya bien de todo el saber hacer que hay en el ámbito humanitario. Es decir, las normas de, del proyecto Espera, la norma humanitaria esencial, las indicaciones de los clústeres, es decir, dan todo un know-how que es muy antiguo en el ámbito humanitario y que creo que es iniciativas como esta pues, se, se, se pueden aprovechar. Desde el tercer lugar, coincido también con la necesidad de un seguimiento y de una evaluación bastante cercana al terreno y no solo en los aspectos técnicos, sino en los aspectos de impacto más allá de lo meramente técnico. Como también muchos en esta sala conocen, el ámbito humanitario, vamos, humanitario está lleno de mala conciencia, es el famoso do no harm, eh, de no hacer daño, y muchas actuaciones, no por supuesto en el partenariado público-privado solo, sino de los, los, los actores humanitarios, han estado llenas de impactos negativos y creo que eso hay que medirlo mucho. Y un cierto principio de precaución pues sería eh, vamos, necesario en esto. Por, por lo que además creo que, y ahí coincido con Marta también, en el ámbito de la cooperación española, creo que hay, voy a decirlo en inglés esto que queda más fino, mucho room for improvement en el tema de las alianzas público-privadas. Creo que en una cooperación que está en unas cifras, no vamos a engañarnos, muy bajas en este momento, cualquier aliado es bueno, no solo porque dé fondos, como ha dicho Claudio muy bien antes, sino porque dé también know-how, y creo que hay una, un potencial muy grande pues, en las empresas españolas para, en una cooperación que necesita de otros recursos, poder sumar estos a, eso, a las eh, 
magras cifras de nuestra cooperación en este momento. Gracias. Y bueno, por último, acabo con los comerciales, somos los latinoamericanos. El día 12 de junio, eh, en colaboración con la agencia y con otras entidades como Cruz Roja, como la Caixa, hay una, un eh, bueno, seminario con el presidente del Comité Internacional de la Cruz Roja en el Caixa Forum sobre la experiencia del CICR en eh, temas de eh, colaboración con el sector privado. Gracias. Yeah, thank you so much to the four experts from the front row, and thank you for the announcement of the seminar. So we will be there for sure. And now I think that we can start a round of uh, answer because uh, Kelly and Fulgencio, they have like concrete questions. Maybe we can start with both of you and then we will open the space for the rest if you want to comment. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your comments. It was very rich, actually. We. Uh, uh, thank you for raising the importance of universities uh, that I briefly mentioned. But yeah, actually, we have a lot of, we are trying to develop more and more the partnerships uh, with universities. I mentioned the universities of law. We also work with the University of Architecture in Oslo to find shelter solutions. And uh, well, we've seen uh, through the Alianza Share platform. Uh, um, the, the success of having a university, the university, uh, so in Spanish, I'll try it, Universidad de Politecnica de Madrid, um, facilitating this whole project. It's been, in our cases, it's been very, very successful, and so it's important to raise, to raise uh, their added value. Uh, and you mentioned as well the context, uh, the very different context, uh, emergency and development Oh yeah, I won't enter this, but this is so different. This is two completely different words, two different visions, two different contexts. And that's why I think the transition between both is so difficult, so sensitive, but so important, especially for sustainability. Uh, so to answer concretely your question, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to clarify my point. So on the of course, we all arrive with uh, a common objective to work on the common cause, uh, which is to find solutions for the people in need, and that's why make us build those partnerships. And I think this is make uh, this makes us all want to overcome those challenges uh, in coordinating uh, and etc. But I think it's um, also important that. Um, to make things sustainable, uh, and we need to make them sustainable financially too. Um, and so those are questions that we're not usually used to uh, deal with as uh, humanitarian actors, uh, because uh, we are working under most of the case, in most of, of the cases, uh, public funds, but as um, Claudio mentioned earlier, uh, there are so much to do, not enough funds. Uh, and uh, um, this is, I think, a chance that we need to seize here to include the business community. Um, and to keep in mind so that we also have um, different constraints. So for us, having a project which is financially sustainable will not be uh, a major constraint. We don't face the issue. But if we want, for instance, uh, um, the outcomes to be sustainable, it has to be fi financially sustainable. And this is where also the business community has a major added value. So in the case of Allianz, Achere, and the access to energy, I think uh, we're at the very beginning of the partnership, even though those questions have been thought through already. Um, but I was thinking uh, of two other examples I will briefly explain. So the first one was in Dadaab refugee camp, uh, where we've been working with um, communication operator. Um, so for us, it allowed us to provide um, solutions to the refugee, to the refugees in communications, internet, having access to internet and uh, online uh, educational resources. For our partner, it was Safaricom, it was actually something possible um, because um, it was financially sustainable. 
people who were beneficiaries for, for us were seen as uh, customers for Safaricom, even though at the end, we all want to improve their daily life. Another example would be, uh, uh, I attended this, um, this uh, food security high level event uh, that was co-hosted by the EU and WFP, so not my hat here, but, um, uh, and uh, one of the guests was uh, Tetra Pak, the director of Tetra Pak. So Tetra Pak, you know, packaging for food, basically. And um, he was explaining how to solve the issue of food security in the Horn of Africa, that Fulgencio mentioned earlier. Uh, they brought innovative solutions from on how to better package the food so that food is available longer, can be keep, kept uh, longer on the um, Horn of Africa markets. So, of course, at the end, we have the same uh, objective, which is improve the food security in the Horn of Africa. Uh, but for Tetra Pak, there was this added value of, well, there is something to develop. There is activities for us to develop that can be financially sustainable for our company too. So, and so my point was, uh, and thank you again for uh, having the opportunity to clarify, but uh, we are coming for, from two completely different worlds and we need to accept, to adapt, and to be open-minded to uh, the different constraints that we all have. And that's it, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Kelly. Um, I don't know if you want to answer. Sure. Um, Ethiopia. Oops. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to say that working in Ethiopia is easy because it's not. Um, you know, since April last year, they have a state of emergency, meaning that uh, you cannot approach 40 kilometers from uh, on any border that they have uh, with the neighboring countries. But as far as we understand our relations with Ethiopia is key. I mean, it's a government you can partner with and you can sit on the table and talk to. Um, they mean business. And this is very rare to find in the region. Um, so we see it as an anchor of stability, not only within the country, but also outside the country. Now, you can define that uh, anchor in many different ways or qualify it. They have their issues with human rights, with the uh, oppression in peripheral areas, etc. But at least it's a country you can talk to. Um, you know, it's the only country that I see in the region where uh, when you look at the security strategy that they have, they mention food for all. And that means the determination of the government to eradicate poverty. I think it's the only country, um, one of the few in Africa, that they have made that brutal determination to eradicate poverty. We, we may agree with the means, uh, how they are doing it, how inclusive the process is, but at least the, the pledge is there and they, uh, and they fulfill it. I remember last year when uh, you know, rains failed and El Nino was causing uh, ghastly effects in the country. This was the only country that mobilized hundreds of millions uh, to, response to, that, uh, to respond to that uh, um, negative effects of El Nino. I think it mobilized along uh, the same amount as the international community. 800 million. Um, so that tells the tale of, uh, of what Ethiopia is. If it wasn't for Ethiopia providing security in Somalia, that human dam that is now that country, Somalia, those, those gates will open uh, with uh, hundreds of thousands of Somalis moving into the country, into the neighboring countries, creating massive insecurity. So I think we need to see uh, Ethiopia uh, from that perspective, uh, Ethiopia will not continue, will not sign anytime soon. Uh, at least is my view. The the, the 51 Convention on uh, on refugees. They're not going to uh, give them the right to own property. They're not going to give them formally or ratify uh, free movement, the right to uh, to work, etc. But as you said, they are making pledges. They are making pledges in the sense of uh, you know, creating industrial parks, uh, continue this double-digit uh, growth that they have uh, 
been recording since a decade ago, and by creating industrial parks, allocating jobs for refugees in those industrial parks, there are, uh, for 30,000 refugees, they're also pledging to give prime agricultural land to 20,000 refugees. The entitlements you were mentioning, ID cards, uh, driving uh, licenses, etc. It just tell uh, the existence of an opportunity that the international community has to seize in order to um, make sure that the government is not going to backtrack from those pledges, because there are hooks into which we have to uh, that we have to use, and we have to use them smartly. So from from our perspective, to miss that opportunity uh, would be short-sighted. Uh, um, it's something that we cannot afford. Again, a government like Ethiopia, if you don't respond quickly to those, uh, to those pledges they have done, they can backtrack, they retrench, and then you cannot sit on the table with them or discuss these issues. So uh, that's why, uh, um, yes, there are many deficiencies in that dialogue, but there are also many opportunities, and we have to seize them. One point also important when we talk about Ethiopia is to talk their language. Um, when it comes to, to refugees, um, normally we talk, conventional wisdom is to talk about camps, but 70% of the refugees in the region are in urban centers. They are, not in, they are not in camps, and this is something we need to address. For us to have an urban uh, refugee policy that we can implement, uh, to have uh, uh, um, provide out of camp support, that's very important. That uh, we talk to the local communities, we talk to the government that can provide um, uh, those essential basic uh, services that uh, host communities and refugees uh, want. Uh, it's not just refugees. Uh, I tend to see it more as uh, uh, the international community providing an integrated development response, integrated, in the host communities that also, by implication, will benefit the refugees because that's the only way we can uh, at least help an assimilation process and an integration within local communities. Otherwise, uh, if we talk only about refugees, we're gonna create tensions with the host communities and uh, create a pernicious uh, effect. Um, so I think uh, that concept of urban resilience we're talking to, uh, uh, talking about refugees is essential because the majority of them, they are not in camps, they are in urban centers. Yep. So we have very limited time, but I don't know if, um, will you, if any of you, would you like to add something or make any further comments on the topic or we can maybe open the, the floor to the public if any of you have a question. Okay, perfect. Um, I wanted to quickly add, I'll be brief, um, to, actually I wanted to add on all, but I won't, but from the question from uh, NRC on how we work with governments, and I think that's, uh, um, and how we can make sure that we include the governments in the process and make sure that we have the right authorization, uh, et cetera, and I understand that in Ethiopia, um, and, you explained some of the uh, challenges with that. I have an example uh, how we are doing this in Sudan, and I think um, how we should be doing that and hopefully are doing that in many of the countries when we are there always on invitation of the government. And we have to make sure that um, the programs we develop are programs that um, help the people on the ground as much as possible, but the program should be designed and developed in a way that can be sustainable by its own and can be transitioned to government if necessary. So what we do when we start programs and implementations, we do consultations with the government to also map their capacities and utilities and find out in which areas of the program they can be included or we can help them in building their capacity. Um, that can be a, a long process in some areas, especially when these are uh, new areas we work in, but we have to do that because otherwise, at the end of the project, we are we are with a project where the funding is gone and, and we have not built the capacities in either the communities or the government who needs to take over to do that. Um, so where we can, we try to involve them in the whole process um, 
In Sudan, for example, where we do the institutional stoves, we have identified the experts in the government who are actually doing the technical uh, quality assessment of the, the institutional stoves that are being built. Um, in Burundi, and then I'm also touching on a, a di different uh, subject. In Burundi, uh, we do the same, but we're also looking at building capacities outside of the government. For example, in the private sector, um, in these public-private um, collaborations, we are there basically because um, there is no private sector there in this area, so we need the private sector. And it's not only that we look at private sector to get um, inputs and, 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 and skills and expertise for them, but we also have to do that the other way around, as you said. We do not have a monopoly on, on, on doing good, and an example um, we do there is we are actually identifying some of the struggling or smaller startup private sector companies who we hope um, that are thriving so that the people we work with actually have access to these solutions and we bring in a technical partner to also train these um, uh, private partners to scale up and, and, and become bigger and, and find better solutions because in the end that will also help um, the people we work with. So quickly touching on both of these subjects but very good questions and thank you for your inputs on that. Thank you, Daphne. So, Claudia? Yeah. Gracias. Eh, solamente aportar a lo que se ha dicho de la innovación por parte de la empresa privada en estas alianzas eh, que pueden traer, a, 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 en este caso, el campo de refugiados. Es, existe un proyecto de, de IKEA, IKEA que en Jordania en campamentos refugiados de, del orden de 150 millones de dólares eh, para producir allí eh, productos que posteriormente eh, pueden, van a ser distribuidos o están siendo eh, vendidos a través de su cadena. Eh, un, un proyecto súper interesante de cómo la empresa privada puede participar también en, en, en este tipo de, 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 de ayuda y en actividades. Existe otro proyecto también eh, entre empresas privadas y la cooperación suiza en Tayikistán eh, que ellos desarrollaron eh, también electricidad eh, para comunidades eh, muy pobres eh, que si bien es cierto no, no están directamente asociadas a, a, a campamentos de refugiados pero que sí han sido muy importantes para desarrollar esta cooperación privada en, 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 en ámbito de servicios eh, públicos, en la provisión de servicios públicos como es el de electricidad, y, y que ha dado muy buenos eh, resultados porque se, se hizo se, en comunidades muy pobres que no donde no existía primero el servicio y segundo el concepto de pagar por un servicio. ¿ah? Y, y allí a la comunidad... Se le, ha, se le ha entregado este servicio, eh, con, han tenido que pagar una pequeña cantidad de dinero y para aquellos que no podían eh, pagar eh, mediante subsidios, ¿cierto? se ha llegado a, eh, a sustentar este servicio a través del tiempo y ha llegado a ser tan exitoso que incluso está exportando electricidad hacia áreas de Afganistán que como ustedes saben, sí está con mucho más problemas de, de refugiados, de guerra, y, y que no cuenta con alguno de estos servicios para poder hacer un, eh, poder escalarlos a un más alto nivel y poder di distribuirlo eh, o, o reproducirlo, mejor dicho, en otras áreas. Quería mencionar esos dos ejemplos uh, de cooperación privada también en, uh, y, y en el ámbito público. Gracias. I don't know, Maria Jesús, do you want to add something about this project? In Claudio has just mentioned this project in, in Jordan um, in collaboration with IKEA. And um, I mean, it's, um, this has been developed and uh, launched uh, on the 17th of May. Many of you might have already seen it. And um, in Adrak, which is one of the two refugee camps in, in Jordan, has become like the first clean energy refugee camp. Um, with the, uh, the solar um, power that has been installed. And um, I'm just reading what the press note said. Um, it says that it will provide clean energy free of charge to some 
20,000 Syrian refugees living in, in shelters, and it will be expanded to provide to 36,000 refugees um, next year. So um, that's another, I mean, another way of supporting, and this is a, an initiative that has been done in, in collaboration with, um, with the IKEA Foundation. Thank you. And just to thank you, I, I want to give a special thanks. Quiero dar gracias especiales a los de la Universidad Politécnica, ya que <laughs> tengo el micro, porque la verdad es que eh, bueno, su trabajo ha sido crucial, su empuje ha sido fundamental. En muchas ocasiones han estado reemplazándonos a muchos de los que estábamos empujando. Y, y bueno, pues eh, sí que me apetece, eh, yo creo que en nombre de, de todos los que conformamos esta, esta alianza, eh, bueno, pues... Eh, dar realmente una, una mención, hacer una mención especial a, a todo el equipo. Tengo aquí a Alejandra, está Carlos, está Manuel, está Javier, está, está Ruth, estaba por ahí también en los inicios. Así que, bueno, pues desde, desde ACNUR eh, apreciar ese, ese trabajo bien hecho, esa ilusión y, y ese interés que nos va a llevar a, a hacer otras, otras muchas cosas juntos. Well, thank you, Maria Jesus, for the, for the knowledge, but uh, thank you for the information about the project. I, I want to thank you to all the members of the partnership because I, I do believe that it's essential that all of us are involved, otherwise never would be possible. So, I mean, I really thank you for mentioning the university work, but uh, um, in this partnership, all of the members make a huge effort and a huge work. So I think that we should just recognize the work of all of us. And just because we have really limited, limited time, we're going to ask for maybe two questions for the public, but we really beg you to be like conscious, not reflection, just question and go straight to the point. So if any of you have <laughs> any, any concern or anything that you want to, yeah? Okay. <risa> Gracias. Mi nombre es Julio Eisman de la Fundación Nacional de Microenergía. Eh, mi pregunta concreta es, ¿qué sistema existe para integrar todas las experiencias y conocimientos que se están haciendo en campos de refugiados de tal forma que nuevos actores que vengan al futuro no partan de cero y empiecen la rueda, sino empecemos ya a trabajar sobre la experiencia de los demás. Eso yo creo que es un papel fundamental. Another question there. So maybe we can both of them and then... A very quick question in terms of um, energy access, coming back to the theme and, and thinking how can we optimize energy access to beyond lighting in the refugee context? I mean, we've talked about going from development, from humanitarian... Uh, situation to development um, as the long-term nature of these camps and so a uh, question to the panel as a whole um, you know how could we use energy access to move beyond lighting and to more um, energy for productive uses to create jobs or to do more food processing and stuff like that thank you okay okay so yeah Claudia desde la perspectiva <coughs> PPP, que es lo que estamos nosotros trabajando, las normas que estamos desarrollando en la Comisión Económica para Europa y las Naciones Unidas, tenemos un proyecto eh, de reunir 500 casos donde, eh, para poder entregarlo, tanto positivo como negativo, ¿eh? para usarlos como experiencia, eh, y poder distribuirlo eh, a todos aquellos que estén interesados en el desarrollo de, de alianzas público-privadas, en todos los ámbitos de la infraestructura, digamos, en el caso nuestro. A, acá estamos hablando más bien concentrado en el tema humanitario, eh, eh, refugiado. Eh, ya hemos reunido unos cuantos. Este ejemplo que, que de, de la Alianza Chile es uno de nuestros casos que, tenemos, eh, que hemos recolectado y que lo, lo tenemos eh, puesto a disposición del público. Eh, pero tratamos de tener, de, hablamos nosotros de 500, de esa forma poder distribuirlo para todos los que deseen desarrollar alianzas públicas, privadas, y como decía, en todo lo que es infraestructura. Porque eh, eh, 
en el caso de, de, de la Alianza Chile o de lo que hemos estado viendo acá de refugiados, eh, lamentablemente es la consecuencia de inestabilidad previa. O sea, el, el refugiado al final termina siendo una consecuencia de inestabilidad de, distintas, de distinto tipo que está ocurriendo en los lugares donde viven. Eh, nosotros proponemos que a través de las alianzas eh, que están definidas en la Agenda 2030 de Naciones Unidas, adoptada por los Estados miembros, o sea, esto es una definición, es un acuerdo que adoptaron todos los Estados miembros de Naciones Unidas. Eh, está eh, el partnership allí definido como SDG número 17 de trabajar en alianzas y la idea nuestra es, mediante la alianza público-privada, poder proveer un, un, una estabilidad que traiga riqueza y mejor calidad de vida a la gente que finalmente te, eh, evite el conflicto que finalmente es la consecuencia que hemos estado analizando acá. En esos, esos estudios de casos, cada uno los, vamos, los, los publicamos en nuestro website. Gracias. Okay. I don't know if any of you want to answer the question related with lighting, right? Because Do you have any experience on, on lighting? Yeah, okay, Davna. I do not have experience on lighting, but I think the question was how we move it beyond lighting. Um, so uh, as uh, said, WFP is working on, for example, cooking uh, fuel and cooking uh, technologies. And I, I know there are a multitude of organizations under which to save a global working group that's trying to address energy access. And I think also uh, Alianza uh, here Uh, is addressing the multitude of um, uh, energy access issues. Um, how we're moving it beyond, I think we have to take energy as, as a whole. I think we have to understand and really advocate for inclusion of energy for multiple issues and challenges that we have. Um, and I think um, seminars like this, um, impact analysis, um, studies, um, all have to contribute to underline that energy is not only necessary for lighting, it's not only necessary for uh, business development, it's not only necessary for, for cooking, but it's necessary to address so many different issues. And I think we're making progress in that um, and hopefully can continue to do so. Mm, if you don't have any other comment on further comments on that, I think that I will I would like to invite the leader to make a wrap up and summary with the main conclusion of the session. Okay, this is going to be tough because I've tried to do this as we say in English on the hoof. So picking up the different comments people have been making and trying to make sense of them. So forgive me if it comes out as a bit of a jumble. Okay, so the first thing that strikes me and maybe one of the key lessons is that we need to ensure that the partnership arrangements we develop are context specific, tailor made for specific contexts. We've heard from some of the speakers and the panel that we need to take account of institutional and regulatory frameworks. I would also add socio-historic contexts organizational and individual context, as well as the humanitarian and development context. And if we don't do this, we're in danger of actually creating problems for ourselves. So this, this would be my number one thing. And I would also suggest that we cannot take one partnership and replicate it or copy it in another context. That is not going to work. What we can do is transfer the learning. And I think Julio's question was very, very good because it's about how do we learn from other experiences of partnership in different contexts so we know not just what works, which is fantastic, but what does not. And what are the particular contextual nuances or sensitivities that make it work here and not there. And if we don't get to grips with that, we are, we're in trouble. Okay. The second thing is that um, from what we've heard, uh, there seems to be um, recognition of the importance of diversity, the involvement of different actors in partnership. Much emphasis is placed on the role of the private sector. We've heard, for example, that there's been a review of the private sector role in humanitarian action. We're seeing a trend away from the private sector just giving cash. 
It's also now being credited with technical input, its own knowledge and skills. But there is also an acknowledgement that relationships with the private sector are not just about big multinationals. They're about a range of foundations, small businesses, business coalitions that also can be involved in partnership. And there is an acceptance, I think, that the private sector in these different manifestations has a role to play, not just in emergency response, but also in disaster preparedness and the building of resilience. Okay? But the private sector is not the only player. And one of my problems with the language that we use in partnership is we are continuing to talk about public-private. Can we not widen out and talk about multi-actor, multi-stakeholder partnerships? The wealth of organizations here at the table, uh, international development agencies, foundations, uh, community groups, civil society organizations, NGOs, we're doing everyone a disservice if we limit our language to public private. Let's widen it out a bit. Co-creation, organizations that cross-cut across different boundaries are also playing an important role. They need to be acknowledged and brought further into the debate. Okay. From what the Aliantha Shire has shared with us this morning, I think we're seeing a, a three-step approach. The first is an approach where um, the, the partnership comes together and very quickly creates some form of tangible, visible change. So communities can see something is happening, change is visible. It's not the same old thing. It's not business as usual or sometime down the line. It's here and now. And when stakeholders appreciate that, they get more involved. They're more willing to engage. What we then see is that the organizations involved, the partners, start to internalize the learning from working together. They realize that actually I'm gaining a lot from working with this organization or, or this other organization. So their own organizational cultures begin to change. They become more open, they value the diversity that collaboration can bring, and they become more creative and innovative in the way they work. And ultimately, and this is a, an aspiration as much as a fact, we hope that they begin to way, change the way things are done. So we develop these inclusive approaches involving the people who are the users, if you like, the end users, and we should no longer be calling them recipients or beneficiaries. They are people who are involved in partnership, and we need to engage with them in these systems of cooperation. And if we begin to do that, maybe we change the rules of the game a little bit and the way that we do things. More and more, and particularly in the framework of the sustainable development goals, I think we're seeing that uh, I'm being daring, I'm being bold, but it's either partnership or perish, okay? We have to work together. There is no alternative. And traditionally, the idea was that when we work together, that's about resource sharing. I put my resources in, I pull my resources, and something happens, some chemistry happens. But that chemistry depends on hard work and long-term changes. It depends on people learning to work together differently. It depends on capacity building, not just those we think are small or don't have capacity, all of us have to develop our capacity to participate and collaborate, and none of us are exempt from that. Um, it also requires imagination and thinking out of the box. And ultimately, as has been uh, reinforced all through today's presentations, it relies on people. The people who we are working with or who we are wanting these services to be improved for, but also the people in our organizations and what I call the intermediaries, who are often never mentioned, and I'm going to do that. These are the people who provide the glue. The Alejandras of this world who are working very, very hard to get people together, to find ways that people can communicate well and promote change. This is a new kind of leadership. Some people are daring to call it a systems leadership, but these intermediaries, engagers, boundary spanners, partnership brokers, whatever you call them, need to be acknowledged and brought in. And then finally, um, I totally agree that we need this um, 
results-based evidence, and we need to be sharing more, and we need to be sharing not just what works, but what doesn't work more and better. And we've got to begin to do that, and I think that this seminar is a wonderful example of doing just that. I think I'm going to stop there. I could say a lot more things, but... <laughs> I did, I did have one more thing to say. As I have emphasized people uh, since the beginning, I would like to thank the panel. I would like to thank the front row experts. I would like to thank you, the public. And once again, I would like to thank the people who are making these partnerships work, including my colleague Alejandra, who's done an amazing job to get this up and running. Thank you.